all for coming tonight. Um, a little bit louder. You might okay. want to use the mic. Yeah. <laughs> You're too soft. Do I need a mic? for student counselors as the uh, community liaison and we've co-sponsored this event with uh, Perkins School of Theology of which I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Robert Hunt for being a key resource and support for us. Um, we're also grateful for the support and guidance of Dr. Uh, Fahrenbacher and Dr. Barkley from our department. Um, I'd also like to thank a couple of key members of the community who have worked really hard to make this event possible as well, and that's uh, Sonia Noor Muhammad and Riyaz Samani, who you'll hear, um, you'll meet later on this evening. We're also really thankful for our panelists. Um, some have traveled far to, to come here tonight, and, um, and some have adjusted their evening and travel plans as well to be here. So. We're really thankful for all of you and um, are excited to have you share your expertise with us this evening. So, the various religions have always required its followers to help those in need. And, um, but we're here tonight to explore the benefits for the individual who actually gives the service. So we'll hear from five scholars, uh, four of which represent the major religions, and one an expert in the mental health profession. So tonight we'll, we'll have each panelist come up uh, and speak a little bit about uh, their faith and philosophy and how service plays within that construct. And then we'll open it up for questions and discussion. And then lastly, we have invited a few local organizations uh, that are doing great work in the community uh, to receive an award of uh, recognition from the Association of Student Counselors. So, we have with us tonight uh, Pravajika Brahmaprana, the resident minister of the Ramakrishna Vedanta Society of North Texas, Rabbi Hanan Schlesinger, executive director and community rabbinic scholar of the Jewish Studies Initiative of North Texas. <laughs> Dr. Robert Hunt, Executive Director of Global Theological Education at SMU. And uh, Shiraz Hajiani, Lecturer at the University of Chicago and PhD Candidate at the University of Chicago Department of Near Eastern Languages and Civilizations. And Dr. Hal Barkley, Director of the Masters in Counseling Program at SMU. So, let's welcome our first speaker, Pravajika Brahmaprana, has been a nun of the Ramakrishna Order at the Vedanta Society of Southern California since 1973. Brahmaprana has compiled and edited several books on Vedanta and has also written numerous articles on the philosophy and practice of Vedanta for journals and anthologies in America and abroad. She is a Vedanta Hindu representative on several interfaith <coughs> councils and a frequent guest lecturer at schools. Service has always been important within Hinduism, <clears throat> within all Hindu sects, whether they be dualistic, qualified non-dualistic, or monistic. But it's always been, traditionally, on a personal level, 
not organizational, that is, until the advent of the Ramakrishna mission, the order to which I belong. And I'll explain later why and how this uh, developed. So what is the, the motivating force behind social service in Hinduism? Three things, I would say. Dharma, which loosely translates as ethics, <coughs> righteous living. Hinduism's uh, philosophy of the interconnectivity of all life and the ideal of compassion for all creatures. Service is actually called ishta purta, and that means sacrifice and charity as a way of leading to liberation. <clears throat> On a personal level, if you go to India and you're a guest, you're treated as God himself or herself. It's quite an experience. Anyone who comes to one's home is given shelter, food, and alms. The wealthy and pious Hindus arrange special occasions to feed the poor, clothe the poor. On a village level, Dharmic Hindus build way stations for the pilgrims and the sadhus. They construct feeding stations for the monks and the poor. And they build ponds and schools for the common good. Now, with the advent of the Ramakrishna order, social servants was jetted up a notch. It went beyond the inspiration of dharma, the interconnectivity of life, and even compassion itself. But it is rooted in Vedanta, a little pamphlet that you have, which means literally the end of the Vedas. Anta means end. The Vedas are the oldest living scriptures of the world. And that would be the Upanishads, the revelations of the ancient seers of India. It's a monistic philosophy. The tenets are simple. God, what we call Brahman, is. God can be realized. Our true nature is divine, what we call Atman. And this Atman and Brahman, God immanent and God transcendent, are one. The goal of life is to make this knowledge our own, self-realization, and the harmony of religions. Truth is one, sages call it by various names. So says the Rig Veda. Now there are four methods of union, and they relate to the four aspects of our psychophysical being. First of all, our emotional level, bhakti yoga, which is the path of devotion, the path of prayer and worship. Karma yoga, which deals with this, a topic tonight, is the path of action, our active nature, which is seeking union by transforming our work into worship in a dedicated, unselfish, and detached spirit. Raja yoga deals with our contemplative nature. It's the path of psychic control to perfect the mind as an instrument of clear insight into truth. And finally, jnana yoga, which deals with our intellectual nature, and that is leading the intellect into a path of inquiry through analysis and discrimination to discover the true nature of reality. Non-dual Vedanta accepts all gods as the one God. Therefore, monism is different from monotheism. So God and Vedanta can be both personal and impersonal. The personal God can be Christ, Buddha, Krishna, Yahweh, Allah, all of which symbolize what is beyond name and form. But the mind cannot surpass symbols. It needs a symbol in which to begin to focus uh, the energies of light from the mind. The formless Brahman we call Sat Chidananda. Sat, the existence through which everything else exists. Chit, pure consciousness that contains all knowledge, and ananda, undiminished bliss, the peace that passeth all understanding. Now a little bit about Ramakrishna, because he is the one that lifted the bar <coughs> of social service in the Hindu tradition. He lived, he was an Indian mystic who lived from 1836 to 1886, and he experienced Satchitananda at least every day, if not several times a day. 
and knew from first-hand experience the truth of the unity of all existence and how to put it into practice through social service. Once he was asked by devotees who came to the temple where he worshipped, what were the devotional practices of those who followed Lord Krishna? And he said, there are three, devotion to God, compassion for all living beings, and service of devotees of God. But then he went into a mystic state, what is known as samadhi. And he said to himself, compassion for all beings? No, not compassion, but service to all as manifestations of God. No separation. So this service, the social service, that was developed in the Ramakrishna mission is actually the worship of unity in diversity. The same God, the same higher self within all. So this karma yoga, this path of action, is selfless service, work as worship. Now Vivekananda, who was the foremost disciple of Ramakrishna, took this to the West. He came to America at the 1893 Chicago Parliament of Religions. He revolutionized Indian monasticism. He revolutionized Hinduism. The ideal up until then had been for monastics, self-realization alone. But with Vivekananda, our model was not only self-realization, but for the good of the world. What Vivekananda did was he took monks out of the caves, out of the hermitages, and put them into the hospitals, the schools, the hostels, the orphanages. And in this way, monastics progressed much more rapidly in the realm of social service, rather than those contemplatives who were still in their caves. He revolutionized <coughs> Hinduism because today, Vivekananda's ideal has spread throughout India and the Indian government simply cannot handle the number of volunteers who come forward during the disaster relief. In America, our social service is a little different. The need here is spiritual. And so the Vedanta societies in this country teach meditation. They give spiritual retreats. They teach spiritual practices without charge. We have Vedanta literature to send this out, libraries, catalogs, and we engage in interfaith dialogue as part of our social service. In the 1970s, when Americans began to experience the, the problem of the homeless, our mission changed somewhat. We were invited to establish prison ministries, which we do, feed the homeless and the poor, which we do, counsel for hospice, and also counsel on college campuses of our own parishioners. In a nutshell. Thank you. Our next speaker is Rabbi Hanan Schlesinger who serves as the Executive Director and Community Rabbinic Scholar for the Jewish Studies Initiative of North Texas, which he founded in 2010. His entire career before coming to Dallas has been devoted to teaching Jewish studies to young adults, primarily in the various colleges of Jewish studies and seminaries in the Jerusalem area. The past year, he was the recipient of the Rabbis Without Borders Fellowship sponsored by the National Jewish Center for Learning and Leadership. Please welcome Rabbi Hanan Schlesinger. Good evening, everyone. The truth is that it wasn't easy for me to agree to speak this evening. It was hard for me to wrap my head around the topic of the evening. My, uh, my life, all the concepts that I know are filtered through 
traditional Jewish texts, traditional Jewish concepts. And I didn't immediately connect who I am and uh, what I know to the idea of uh, service uh, as a means towards personal universal well-being. And I had to think, how do I translate uh, a concept which sounds to me, or sounded to me, uh, a professional concept or a, a Christian concept into uh, something in Jewish experience in Jewish language. I asked myself, what is this uh, thing that they call service? What do we call it? Do we have such a concept as Jews? What does it mean to me? So we're not that long after Martin Luther King Day. And everyone knows that Martin Luther King, Dr. King, proclaimed, let my people go. And we also know, I think most people know, that he consciously took that from the Bible, from the book of Exodus. <laughs> what many people don't know is that he only took half the quote. Now, I'm not criticizing him, but if you really want to know the deeper meaning of that biblical phrase, let my people go, that repeats itself again and again and again in the Jewish Bible, in the beginning of Exodus, we open up there and we see that it never ever says in a vacuum, let my people go. The phrase always continues, let my people go that they may serve me, says Moses in the name of God. What did I just say? Let my people go that they may serve me. Ah, I just found that concept of service. Let my people go that they may serve me. However, of course, as you immediately realize, we have found the concept of service in the Hebrew Bible now, but it's not service to our fellow men. It's service to God. God says, I want those slaves from Paro so that they can serve me. Not serve Paro, but serve me. It's not about serving men. It's about serving God. And indeed, uh, the fundamental matrix of all of Judaism is service to God. Those exact words from the beginning of the book of, of Exodus. It's about, in Judaism, doing what God wants me to do. It's not about me, it's about God. It's about seeing myself not as a speck of dust, not as a individual, but as part of a larger unit. It's about a large, universal, unified reality in which I'm just a small piece. I'm doing my service to God, trying to do my service to God. Since Judaism is all about service to God, therefore, clearly, we almost never talk about rights, but rather about obligations. Not about human rights, but about human obligations. Judaism understands, phrases our human obligations in terms of specific commandments, specific acts. 613, the word in Hebrew is mitzvot, 613 commandments that Jews are commanded to do. Considered to be divine commandments with their foundation in Hebrew scripture in the first five books of the Hebrew Bible. Those first five books we call the Torah. And these commandments, these elements of service to God are divided into two main types. Commandments between man and God and commandments between man and man. They're all divine commandments. They're all God commandments. But some of them are between man and God, meaning that the recipient of the commandment, the object of the commandment is God, whereas there are other divine commandments in which the object is your fellow man. Let me give you examples just to make it more concrete, and I'll make it very concrete, because uh, Judaism is all about the very concrete examples of commandments between man and God. Uh, not eating is a negative. Don't eat food that is not kosher. Lobster or shrimp or turtle or ants or foodstuffs in, foodstuffs in which meat and milk are combined, that's a no-no for Jews. That's a mitzvah between man and God. Or the prohibition against incest, right? That's between man and God. Or the prohibition on a man of physical intimacy with a woman who's menstruating, or the commandment to desist from work on holidays, or the commandment to fast on the holiday of Yom Kippur, all negative commandments between man and God. But what we're interested in is commandments between man and man. For example, the prohibition against humiliating someone, the prohibition against slander, prohibition against murder and theft, prohibition against bearing a grudge or taking revenge. 
or the positive obligation to visit the sick, bury the dead, comfort the mourner, to give charity to honor parents, to judge others favorably. Those are all specific, decreed, discreet commandments among the 613. And I just gave examples of those that are between man and man. In other words, a divine commandment in which we are to bring a clear benefit to concrete human beings or to refrain from hurting or damaging concrete human beings. So we're defining, Judaism defines these acts of goodness towards man as elements of service to, to God. The whole rubric is the service to God. We're fulfilling, Jews are fulfilling a religious precept which means serving God and connecting to God at the same time that concerning some of these commandments, the ones between man and man, were bringing benefit to fellow men. Now, when we talk, or if we talk, about the benefit of this type of service, the benefit to the, to the person who is performing, who is doing, I'm going to suggest that if we cut this off from the larger context, we're being profoundly myopic. We're missing the forest for the trees from a Jewish perspective, and I'll explain. So look, it's true, it's a truism that service to our fellow human beings provides our lives with deep meaning. We feel needed. We feel we've done something worthwhile, we've accomplished something, our existence is not in vain, and in serving others we bond with them, we feel connected to something beyond ourselves. We're not just a little speck of dust floating aimlessly in the vast cosmic wilderness. Of course, what I just said now is not particularly Jewish, of course, it's all perfectly true. And for modern secular man, service to the other is clearly a way of finding deeper meaning in one's life. To me, that's like, doesn't have to be said. However, from a Jewish point of view, that is only one small element of a larger system, and I would not want to take it on its own. Because from a Jewish point of view, life's meaning indeed does come from service to others, but not just, not merely from that, and not even directly from that. Rather, serving others, as I've been trying to put forth, is part of something larger. It's part of serving God. It's part of a vast universe of meaning and joy in which I'm connected, not just by serving others, but by every individual act of performing precepts, every act of serving God, I'm connected to a larger picture that encompasses all of being and all of time. I'm not exaggerating, by the way. <laughs> That's my experience. I have a role, and I have a purpose, and I know who I am and why I'm here. I'm part of a chain of tradition in which I'm serving God, not alone, but together with past generations and future generations, as well as with Jews in the present all around the globe. And that sense of connection, that sense, therefore, of uh, wholeness with the fabric of being comes not just, it comes from, but not just from serving others. It comes from every single mitzvah act, every single act that's part of the framework of commandment. And that sense of <coughs> meaning, one part of it, but only one part of it, comes from like the fulfillment of commandments between man and man. So fulfillment of these commandments between man and man adds an additional portion of joy and meaning to my life, I'm speaking personally, for all the reasons that Adler and his followers have found, but also for reasons that go beyond it. When I comfort the mourners and visit the sick, I'm not only serving those people and connecting to those people that I'm serving, and I'm not only connecting to the others who are serving together with me, but I'm connecting to all other Jews that have done that act in the past, in the present and in the future, I'm connecting to God. I'm connecting to a larger tapestry. And I'm becoming something, part of something much, much bigger than myself. <laughs> Let me just go back and flesh out something that was implicit, I think, up until now in what I was saying, but 
not clearly stated. Judaism is constituted as a system of commandments, meets a vote, and the commandments are overwhelmingly <coughs> discrete, quantifiable, physical deeds. What that means is that Judaism is not primarily about belief. Not at all. It's about deeds. One of the things the panel was asked to relate to is the afterlife. So Judaism believes in the afterlife, but it's not important. What's important is this life, this world, the deeds we do. We have some beliefs. Uh, God is one of them. Pretty important. But it's important not in a vacuum. It's important in that it commands me. The belief in God brings upon me the command to do things in this world. And as I said, some of those things are between man and man. Judaism is all about the physical world. It's about the body within the soul, which means it's about the community. It's about physicality. Because human beings are not just souls. We're souls within a body. We're minds within corporality. And it's all about that amalgam of the body and the soul. We do in this world, this world which God created and placed us in, we do what we do, not for the sake of another world, but for the sake of God who put us in this world and for the sake of, of this world. Being that we're in a Christian country, and the buckle of the Bible belt, and an SMU, no less, uh, I have to respond to the millennia-old Christian critique of the con conceptual system that I just put forth. And that's, of course, the critique of legalism. Like, I'm only on one foot, so I'm not going to say that much. But I do want to say that the Jewish experience is that serving mankind as the fulfillment of legal commandments within a framework of divine service does not, in my experience, detract from the quality of the connection between human beings. It does not make the acts perfunctory and it does not suck the soul out of them. Neither the man nor the deed is made heartless. Our system does not subtract, but it rather adds. The inner experience is facilitated, and then we're close to the end of my time. I want to tell a story. True story. As I was writing the notes that I'm reading from right now, the notes for this lecture, I came to the part that I mentioned earlier, in which I was listing the commandments, some of them between man and man. And one of those commandments, of course, was burying the dead. As I typed those words, I said, uh-oh, I'm supposed to go to a funeral today. <laughs> I looked at my watch. The time was 8 minutes to 12. I looked at my calendar. It said funeral at 12 o'clock. I looked outside. Snow. <laughs> and wind. I looked outside the other side. No car. My wife took the car to work and I forgot to tell her. <laughs> believe it. So what did I do? I put on my boots and my rain jacket and I went outside and I walked to the funeral. I arrived a little bit late. And the reason I tell that story is that I wonder, and I sincerely wonder, I don't have an answer, but I wonder if I was going to the funeral merely because, I say in quotes, merely because I had a deep, deep connection to the mourners, if that was the only reason I was going, would I have gone? In the snow, by foot. I went because I was commanded. One of them exposed is to get to the funeral. So I got to the funeral. Ultimately, what helped me to decide to go was the commandment. But when I got there, clearly, I wasn't thinking, okay, I perform my legal commandment, I have no connection to the deceased. No. Being there, as a result of the sense of obligation, being there helped me to strengthen <coughs> my deep sense of compassion and connection to the deceased and to, and to the mourners. So it's the doing in Judaism that allows us, that facilitates, that forces us and helps us to develop that sense of inwardness, in the case of commandments between man and man, that sense of connection to God through man, to man and to God. Uh, put differently, the legal obligation encouraged me to do the act, and doing the act aroused and facilitated all the appropriate emotions and human reactions. So this is a central pillar of Jewish thought, Deeds engender emotions. Outwardness engenders inwardness. What you do influences and molds who you are. 
We perform the commandments decreed by God. Whether those done vis-a-vis -vis God or those done vis-a-vis -vis our fellow man, and in doing so we serve God, at the same time we build our personalities and engender a rich inner world. To sum up, Judaism, when practiced fully and sincerely, can and should contribute to a deep sense of meaning and connection and well-being. Acts of charity and kindness toward our fellow human beings are part of the matrix that helps us become full and fulfilled human beings, but it's only part of the picture and not the whole picture. And they are part, all these seeds are part of that picture most effectively only when they are integrated into larger religious context. Thank you. speaker is Dr. Robert Hunt, who is presently Director of Global Theological Education at the Perkins School of Theology at SMU, where he teaches courses in world religions, Islam, interreligious dialogue, and mission studies. Dr. Hunt is author of several books, including Islam in Southeast Asia and Muslim Faith and Values, What Every Christian Should Know. He reports the governing principle of all his work is that every person, culture, and society has something valuable to offer to others, and that we discover this through a critical and appreciative study, open dialogue, and a willingness to learn. Please welcome Dr. Robert Hunt. Well, it's, it's a pleasure to be here in my own lecture hall. Anyway. <laughs> But I'm not usually actually allowed to teach about Christianity here. Uh, I teach all the other religions. So it's nice to be entrusted with this uh, as, a, as a homeboy um, in, my, uh, in my own thing. I'm going to keep my remarks pretty straightforward and brief, and, and I'm very much within the bounds of orthodoxy, Christian orthodoxy. And I'll start with, by saying um, something that ought to be obvious, but if it's not, it needs to be said which is that Christianity is a soteriological religion. It is focused on the question of salvation. Uh, that, that The concept that runs right through the Christian New Testament, Christian teaching, the Christian Bible. And if you're going to talk about salvation in Christian terms, you're talking about the fact that there must be a problem in the human relationship with God, and that you need to have a solution. Right? And that, that kind of dichotomy is very characteristic of our Christian thought. We have a problem with God, we humans. I don't think God has a problem with us. But we have a problem with God. And it needs to be solved. Okay. And the solution, to use the term that's most commonly found, I think, in the New Testament, the solution to the problem that humans have with God is that they need to be reconciled to God and participate in the life of God. The reconciliation thing means that our problem is we're, we're at a distance from God. We have somehow gotten separated from God. We need to get back together with God and we need to participate in God's life. And in this sense, if we're talking about our own sort of psychological well-being, um, the, the Christian analysis of all forms of disease, disturbance, mental pathological things, everything that happens in society, all ultimately at its root comes because we are distant from God. And our distance from God then affects every, every portion of our being in a negative way. And the only way that we can come back into a healthy personal state and a healthy social state is to be reconciled to God and to participate in the life of God. Now, thus far I have not said anything that in my study of world religions is very far outside the teaching of other religious traditions. <laughs> okay. um, what makes Christianity distinctive is that we believe that you are reconciled with God through the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus who we call the Christ. Um, and that the way in which you preeminently, a human being, preeminently participates in the life of God is by participating in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And the reason for that is that Jesus is regarded as God. Right? So to participate in the life, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus is to participate in the life of God. That, it's that simple, really. 
Uh, obviously, it's much harder to explain theologically, but we have two semesters on that. But um, <laughs> the basic idea is conceptually simple. Jesus is God. Participate in the life of Jesus, you participate in the life of God. Okay? And it is that, it is that particular belief that makes Christianity a distinctive religion called Christianity after the Christ, which is the term that evolves in the New Testament to refer to the divinity of Jesus. Jesus is the Christ. Jesus is God. Okay. Now, how do we make that concrete? This is all very good theological ideas, but how do you make it concrete? And that actually isn't that hard either, although it has to do with this um, difficult for some people uh, Christian concept of the Trinity. Um, we Christians believe that God is self-related. Um, I think the best way to do this is to use terminology that is actually found in some other religious realms and to say that we conceptualize God as God the lover, God the beloved, and God as love itself. Okay. So when we say God is love, love implies the one who loves, the one who is loved, and love itself. And we normally, there's a danger of heresy in Christian terms here, but we normally associate God as love, beloved, and love itself as God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Okay. Now, having said that, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, God the Lover, God the Beloved, and God is love itself, we can then begin to see the ways in which Christians conceptualize human life as participation in the life of God, and also particularly then pull out what it means to serve. When we talk, and this is a classic threefold distinction that hopefully all of my students have learned. Um, first of all, we talk about the importance of worship. In worship, the Christian at worship is a Christian lifted up into God's spirit and engaged in the internal life of the divine as love. That's what we do when we worship. We, we, it is not us looking to God. It is us being lifted up into the life of God, the rich life of God. And we, we have ritual means of doing that, right? Um, as do other religions, by the way. But that's worship. And so worship is one of the three key things. Worship is the way in which the Spirit of God lifts us into the life of God, and we participate in the inner, rich inner life of God. The second thing that we talk about, um, there are Greek words for these two, by the way, but I'm not sure I remember all three, um, is fellowship. Okay, koinonia is the Greek word. And we have fellowship with our fellow human beings, which Christians say means that we join together in the body of Christ, now in the particularly humanness of Christ, um, as those who experience God's love. So in the fellowship that we have together as Christians, we experience the embrace of God who is the lover for the beloved. We become the body of Christ, Christ is the beloved, and we experience the love of Christ. Um, it happens that in this fellowship, the way in which we experience that is in the love that we offer each other in the Christian fellowship. So God, God loves my fellow Christians through me, and they love me, and God loves me through them. But the third thing that we talk about is service. <coughs> and this is the third aspect. So there's worship, which can, uh, coincides with the Spirit of God. Um, there is uh, fellowship, which coincides with with uh, the Son of God, right? And there's service. And basically, in Christian service, personal, individual, and congregational, we join in the life of God with the world because the server serves creation. The server serves, guides, helps God's creation. And God, or to put it another way, God is the lover of the world. God is the lover of the world. And when we engage in service in the world, to the world, to our fellow human beings, we join and participate in God's love for the world. Therefore, we participate in God. And therefore, because we are now participating in God, we are reconciled with God's purposes. And this, along with the other two, reorients us, remakes us in our interior being, and makes us the human beings that we want and, and need to be. And in a certain sense, this is a conceptually simple, I think, um, but profoundly important. That the reason we serve our fellow human beings is because that is the means by which we participate in the life of God in relationship to the world. 
And we know that when we participate in the life of God in relationship to the world, in relationship to our fellow Christians, and in, in through worship, then our inner being is remade. It is remade into its original image. And its original image was pacific with itself. It was at peace with itself. It was at peace with its neighbors. It was integrated. It was whole. It was sane. And so all of this is to say that service along with worship and fellowship is a way that we return to our original personhood. We return, we return to what it means to be human. And therefore, it is a way in which well-being is achieved. Of course, for others. But of course, for ourselves as well, as we participate in God. Um, and that's really basically it. Um, I could spin this out over two or three semesters, and I'll do that in another class session. <laughs> Next speaker is Shiraz Hajiani. He is a PhD candidate in Islamic history and civilizations at the University of Chicago. He is a lecturer at the University of Chicago Graham School where he teaches Islamic history and literature. He has a Master of Theological Studies from Harvard Divinity School and is also on the steering committee of the International Theology Conference in Jerusalem. Please welcome Shiraz Hajiani. through the Wilson phase, and Wilson's left and deflated. <laughs> I love that you get that reference. Younger students don't get that reference. So he's gone through that phase, and he's now working on, I've got to keep sane. I'm going to go nuts here. By the way, Life of Pi, a great movie to watch. Uh, but he's going through this phase of saying, okay, how do I keep my sanity? And he's the son of a car. He says, aha, let me remember what Dad taught me, and I'll build. So he builds this lovely city. Around the 33rd year, he sees signs of ships. So when the ships come in, he's waving, and hey, help, help. They come in, and they say, oh, we didn't know there was life here. There's a whole city on this island. He says, no, no, I built it. He says, really? So he's ready to get on the ship to be rescued and go. But these people are fascinated. They want to check this place out. So they say, at least before we take you away, give us a tour. So he gives them a tour. He's got everything that a city would want. A nice little square, a park, a school, a hospital, you name it. But on the rock, he's got a temple. And then on the other side of town, he's got another temple. The people are puzzled. They say, how come? He says, well, you know, the people that go to that temple will never agree with those. Okay? So I want to begin with that, okay? Thinking that, you know, um, I was tasked uh, to talk about the Muslim perspectives on service. And roughly about 1.5, 1.6 billion people. And I don't think, you know, one can represent that mass. So what you're going to get is what my humble effort is, and I'm following some eminent scholars, so bear with me, I'm going to go to my notes here. So, in the, in the literature that was sent to me, I'm learning about Adler's thoughts, and it's fascinating. 
But in the literature that was sent to me, there was this verse. And I want to talk about this verse. This verse has a little bit of a problem. It's the problem of wow. It's the letter wow. You see it right there. The verse, as it came to me, and as you will see in most translations goes, Your guardian can only be Allah, his messenger, and those who believe, who establish worship and pay the poor do, and bow in prayer. There's a problem there. Okay, so we're associated with the theological school, so let's do some hermeneutics here. This is saying your guardian equals God, the prophet, and this X. The way this reads, it could be in Muslim, it could be any human being. What I'm trying to point out is there's a slight disagreement on this, and it amounts to a disagreement amongst the two major blocks of Muslims, the Shis and the Sunnis. So, bear with me, we talk about difference and then we'll come back and double back and deal with that issue. So how is it dealt with? This wow is a connector. It, is, it can be an and, it can be a punctuation, and in this case, the way it's interpreted by especially Shi authorities, it's a state. So the story goes that Muhammad, when he received this message, got up and started walking towards the mosque, and he ran into an old beggar. And he asked the beggar, can you relate the incident that just happened? And the incident is that this man was going begging for arms. And he'd gone and asked around all over town, and nobody gave him anything, except when he went to the mosque. And all the people standing around at the the mosque was a basic courtyard at this time. It says, nobody paid any attention to me except for that young man, and he was saying his prayer. Pray tell, what was his position? And this is one of the canonical positions of the prayer. Wild vow. So the story goes that yeah, he took off his ring, or put his hand up so the beggar could take his ring. It boils down to one individual. Who is this individual? Ali. So the Muslims look at this and they basically say, all right, this is designating one individual and it's a restrictive verse. Okay? So the verse is saying, the guardian equals Allah, equals the prophet, equals Ali. You with me so far? Okay. This is divergence. But there is convergence. There is convergence on that story. All Muslims, Muslim scholars, are agreed upon that story. That the essential part, whether they disagree on the fact of who the successor of the Prophet was, notions of authority, that's left to the scholars to mess, <coughs> mess with. And it does cause actual societal problems. But the key thing is, the fact of charity is something that all Muslims share. The fact that this young man, while in prayer, gave something of great value to himself, to somebody who was in greater need for it. All Muslims, when they learn the story, learn that lesson. With me so far? Okay. So, when I was teaching, when I was teaching this lesson to uh, my niece's class, and she was, this is grade one we teach this in, so she was about six, seven. And the story was that Ali, while in his prayer, was um, <coughs> the, the beggar came and said, you know, give me alms, and he raised up his finger, hand and the beggar took the ring of his. So the six or seven year old girl says that, Uncle Ali, Hazrat Ali wasn't paying attention to his prayer, was he? <laughs> <laughs> so in every lesson, you've got to learn something, you've got to read between the lines. And remember, kids know how to read between the lines. So let's now turn to the ethic of service. Where does it come from? Here's a verse that I want to share with you. Okay? Most of you, when you have studied or read about Islam, you probably have encountered the five pillar definition. <laughs> Let's talk about what Islam talks about, about the real values. So here's a verse. This is out of the second chapter of the Quran, Surah so Bakra. And I see my time is already <laughs> Um And basically, I'm going to go through what are the elements of this. So it says, it is not righteous that you turn your face to, towards the east or the west. 
at the end of every prayer, Muslims turn to the east and pray for peace, and send a blessing of peace when they turn to, 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 uh, to the east and the west, and, uh, and forward. Okay? So this is saying, ritual is not righteous. So what is righteousness? Righteousness is to believe. To believe in Allah, the last day, the angels, the books, and the messengers. Next, to spend of your substance out of love, out of love for Him. Okay. But for whom? For your kin, for orphans, for the needy, for the wayfarer, for those who ask. Think about it next time you're walking down the streets of Dallas. I know this has been happening sadly a lot more in Chicago since the economic downturn. So when Rabbi, you were speaking about the law actually empowering you to be in service and doing God's work. Here's the Muslim version of that same thing. For someone who's asking, and we know that for the one that's asking, there are probably about 10, 100 more that are not asking. But think about that. Okay? So for, for those who ask, and for the ransom of slaves. So there was a conference at University of Chicago and these students gathering together. They said, should we then have slavery? Because the Quran says that ransoming, ransoming of slaves is meritorious. And by golly, after three hours, they came up with a resolution saying, yes, we should have slavery. But that's another matter. <laughs> the next is to be steadfast in prayer and practice regular charity. To fulfill contracts which you have made and to be firm and patient in pain or suffering, in adversity, and throughout periods of panic. And you might have seen the shirt some people wear, don't panic, I'm Islamic. That's post September 11th. But such are the people of truth, and they're the God-fearing. This is chapter 2, verse 177. Forgive me, timekeeper, I'm going to take a couple more minutes, okay? I want to bring us to a present day manifestation of this. And this is something um, that exists in my community, the Ismaili, uh, Ismaili community, Shia, among the Muslims. Okay? We are, out of the 1.5 billion, if you believe the numbers, we are about 15 million spread around 25 countries. And yet, the institution that, uh, that I'm going to talk about, the Aga Khan Development Network, is probably one of the largest philanthropic networks, private philanthropic networks in the world. Okay. So these are the foundational principles of this institution. Now, as I read this to you, and I've got certain terms highlighted, think about the previous verse that I relate to you, and also think about the, the things that my esteemed colleagues have mentioned. There's a lot of resonance here. The institutional networks derive their impetus from the ethics of Islam, which bridged the two realms of faith, din and dunya, the spiritual and the material. The central emphasis of Islam's ethic, ethical ideal is enablement of each person to live up to his, and I add the her, this was written in 1996, these guys were, and it had to be, <coughs> right? Okay. Have to have the her in there as well. Uh, Enablement of each person to live up to his or her exalted status. And part of this construct is that we human beings have this objectivity of trust and quest. This goes on a little bit. It says, the truly discerning, for the truly discerning, the earthly life, dunya, is a gift to cherish in, it, in as much as it is a bridge to and a preparation for the life to come. Otherwise, it is an enticement, distancing man, or as I put it, the human, from service of God, which is the true purpose of life. Service, service of God is not only worship, but it is also service to humanity and abiding by the duty of trust towards the rest of the creation. Now let's jump to the part highlighted in red. 
without social responsibility. That's what that previous verse is talking about. Social conscience, social responsibility. Without social responsibility, religiosity is a show of conceit. You with me so far? Okay. Islam, and I put that in quotes because I've never met this person. Islam is therefore both din and dunya, spirit and master, distinct but linked, neither to be forsaken. Two sides of the coin. I'm going to jump through this a little bit quickly. Okay. This is a poem that is inscribed at the United Nations. Human beings are members of a whole in creation, one essence and soul. If one member is afflicted with pain, others, other members uneasy will remain. You with no sympathy for human pain, the name human you cannot retain. Saadi dies in the 1200s. <laughs> you see what I'm pointing at? El Plurivasono, central premise of the founding of this country and of what, the magical idea that we all aspire to and the world looks to. Okay. And then there is this. Okay? And this is my humble understanding of part of the Jewish tradition. There is this notion of Tikkun Alam. Did I say that right? The, the mending of the world. But that comes only, in my humble understanding, only when you do this. When you mend the human being. And I want to end with, you know, if you've been watching the news or reading the news recently, uh, Hubble and various other telescopes have made us understand that if we ever thought we were, and the Quran calls the human being the Ashraf al the noblest of beings. But think about the earth, when it is part of the Milky Way, which it is, the estimations are 1.7 billion planets. How many of those are in the Goldilocks range? How many of those sustain life? And that's just our galaxy. Your children's children's <coughs> children perhaps will come into contact with that other being. What then happens to our theologies? We have to be able to understand them in this way of we are creatures of this vastness. And we have to participate in that. Participate in it by you helping me be what I can be and I, in return, give you my shoulder. And just to relate to you, Rabbi, as I was thinking about this, I was thinking about death as well. And I know I'm way over time, but I want to just finish with this. I don't know that in, I don't know too many uh, funeral parlors in the Islamic communities. Because it is an obligation, it is a service that the community carries out. When one of us dies, a male is required to give his shoulder to the beer if a funeral procession is passing by. There are many, many, many other things that all our traditions share. And I want to go and take my seat again and let our last speaker speak, and then let's get into the discussion. <laughs> Our last speaker this evening is Dr. Hal Barkley, a licensed marriage and family therapist, a licensed professional counselor, and presently the director of the counseling program at SMU. Before he began teaching at SMU, he worked as a school counselor and educator for 35 years with the Carrollton Farmers Branch ISD. He has written several articles in counseling journals and made presentations at a number of national meetings. Please welcome Dr. Hal Barkley. Dana came to 
to my office about a year ago. And she had this idea. And she talked about an hour about it. And by the time she left, I was very worried. <laughs> and the reason I was worried was because I thought, this is going to happen. <laughs> and so I better get used to it, and I better start learning what she's talking about. And so one of the things she did, uh, she gave all the panelists all this information. It was like taking a course. And so we had to learn all sorts of things, so I started doing some reading. I learned a term that I did not know. Some of you may know it. Uh, the term is called consilience. Do you know that word? I did not know that word. Uh, Dan Siegel talks about uh, children from UCLA, the new uh, scientist. And he defines consilience as seeking out convergent knowledge across different disciplines. I thought, hmm, so we're being the zone to something. My job tonight is to talk uh, a little bit about mental health. Uh, that last term you used for us was, uh, how do you say the last term? To whom I dom? My humble, uh, Robert can probably set that straight. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> but I think what you said is that is like to heal the human being. And that's what we teach our students to do, uh, hopefully, when they come to our master's program and learn to be uh, marriage and family counselors, LPCs, uh, school counselors, and the like. Um, the first thing they have to do when they get there is they have to take a counseling theory class. And in that theory class, we present to them, across the disciplines, all of these various theorists. And there is uh, Rogers, Boyd, Jung, and Ellis, and you go on and on and on. Um, I, when I teach that class, as in at Lyrian, I tell them that um, you know, my bias is that uh, I've always had an at Lyrian base. Alfred Adler is my man. And so it's always a little uh, scary to me when I get at the end of the term when quite a few of them will choose Adler as their base. Because we tell them, by the time you get to practicum and by the time you get to internship, you need to have one theory so that you may uh, work from that and then you can grow from there. So, uh, we teach our students this, and uh, I think what I, I, I always tell myself is that I'm not biasing them as I'm teaching that course, uh, but they really uh, are drawn to Adler. So, I want to share some of Af uh, Alfred Adler with you tonight so that uh, maybe you will be drawn to him too. Uh, brief history, for those of you who may not know. And some of the students could teach this better than I because they're getting ready for LPC exams, probably. Uh, Adler was uh, uh, born in Vienna. He was Jewish. Uh, he later uh, converted over to Christianity, and that's a story within itself. Uh, but along the way, uh, he uh, became an ophthalmologist and ultimately got interested in psychology and was invited to Sigmund Freud's uh, Wednesday night, here we are, discussion uh, dinners about the field of psychology. That was in 1902 when Adler first uh, attended that. And he and, Ad, uh, he and Floyd uh, were colleagues. I always point that out. A lot of times you hear that uh, Adler was a disciple of Floyd, but I think that's inaccurate. I think they were colleagues. By 1910, they differed on a lot of things. Carl Jung was also part of that uh, dinner community, and he uh, left uh, that community in 1914. So there were some differences of opinion. Freud believed that uh, the human personality uh, got to where it was because we are sexual beings. <coughs> Jung said we are spiritual beings. And Adler finally decided that we are social beings. And that's what drives us towards becoming the, the, the person that we become. Um, Adler started out uh, studying aggression, and that was his interest. But it got slowly changed, and he became interested in the fact that maybe we come into this world with inferiority feelings, and those are natural and those are normal, 
uh, we deal with those all of our life. World War I came along. Uh, he served in the war as a medical officer. Uh, and by the time he returned, he was transformed. And he had uh, decided that, that the fact that we were social beings, that was what he wanted to spend the rest of his life at, uh, teaching. And, uh, and so that's, that's what he did. Um, as part of his belief system about uh, how personality develops, he ultimately said that the, the central criterion for mental health is social interest, the concept of social interest. Uh, and translated, there's a lot of translations of that from German, but the best translation and the one he liked in English the most was a regard for the welfare of others. That's what social interest means. And that's basically uh, what, what he believed. Um, so when a person comes to therapy, uh, if they are lacking in social interest, that may lead them to feeling inferior. That may lead them to feeling discouraged. He saw mental illness uh, as not a sickness, but as discouragement. Um, and so this concept of social interest is where he would start. Now there was a second criterion, and that second criterion was activity. So being interested in the welfare of others and doing something, acting on it, was part of the way you found or re, uh, rediscovered uh, your uh, emotional stability. So that's a real quick view, a snapshot of Adler. Uh, in terms of therapy, Another term that he often used was the word usefulness. And people who can see themselves as being useful in society, in their culture, in their towns, in their community, in their family, have the best chance of uh, achieving uh, emotional health. And so he tied that into social interest as well. Um, so. That's like a, I like uh, flipping through the Bible in five minutes, you know, <laughs> one end to the other. So that's what we just kind of did with Adler. Uh, what, what I tell, what I, I like to uh, tell my students is when I'm talking about Adler in class, uh, I share with them a story. So I thought, I'm going to share that story this evening uh, with you. And the, the story is a simple one. But it explains what happens to a lot of therapists at the beginning. Uh, and this was back in, back in the 80s when I in my private practice. And I, I had a, a woman come in, and she was in a bad place in life. She had uh, <coughs> gone through a divorce. And it was one of those days, you know, that was dark and dreary anyway. And, and so the session just seemed to, got, to get darker and more dreary. And so by the time it was time to go, I was thinking, what do I really have to offer this morning? And so what I teach the students is that when you are in doubt, when you don't know, then go to your theory. Or go to your belief system. And so I go to my theory, and, I, and so that came to me. And so I, I asked the lady, I said, you know, when you leave here in uh, your own, your way home, where, uh, you know, uh, where are you going? How, can you, you have anything to do on the way there? She says, no, I'm going straight to my apartment. It's going to be a lonely night. I said, well, uh, I have a suggestion for you. Is there a Hallmark card store on the way home to your, uh, your house? And she said, well, yes, there is. I thought, oh, I don't know where they are, but she knew that there was one there. And so I said, here's what I want you to do. I want you to stop at the Hallmark uh, store, and I want you to go in, and I want you to think of a friend, a co-worker, a family member, somebody in your life that you know 
that's really having a hard time right now. I said, you know someone like that? She said, well, sure. Yeah, I do. I, I think there's somebody in there. So I want you to buy a card for that person. I want you to take it home. You can write on it any message that you would like, and then mail it. And when you come back next week, we're, we're going to talk about that. She came back the next week. She had done her assignment. Activity. And um, so we discussed that and what meaning that might have in her life. And so when she left that night, I said, by the way, will you go by the Hallmark uh, store again? And she said, sure. I said, what I want you to do is I want you to go in, choose a card that you would choose for yourself that you'd like. Go home, write a message on it, put it in the mail, It'll come the next day for two days. And then when you come back next week, we'll discuss that. Sometimes Adler's theory is uh, set aside as being simplistic. But sometimes therapy can be simplistic if you have a, a theory that works for your client. And it was that was the beginning, really, for her of recovering from uh, what she had experienced. And we continue to uh, design therapy around the possibilities of her helping other people while helping herself. So that in, I don't know, 10 minutes maybe, was a, a thumbna thumbnail sketch of Adler. I'm going to sit down and uh, we'll let Dina come up and she's going to guide us and through some more discussions. Am I correct? We are going to open it up for questions, so if anyone has a question, um, we can take that now. I can start with a question um, while people are gathering their thoughts. I can start with a question um, while people are gathering their thoughts. Um, so, my question is, you know, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics, only 25% of the population volunteered in some capacity last year. Can you speak to maybe why you think that is, what are the challenges in your communities, why you don't think that <coughs> giving of service is, is something that more people are doing? Great question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll offer a, just an observation along these lines. Um, there's I mean, my, my view is that, you know, some people are just lazy. <laughs> Quite a few, actually. Um, but, but apart from that, it, it, um, it, it does seem to me that uh, we've moved into a phase in our culture and society in which we are increasingly convinced that our well-being is dependent on our consumption of things that give us pleasure momentarily or longer term. And that that is, a, that is a constant cultural message and theme. And that as long as we imbibe that cultural message and theme, then um, we, we, that's where we focus our energy and attention. <coughs> and the sort of common sense teaching, I think, of all of our religious traditions, and even the observable common sense thing, which I feel better actually when I engage in social activity and giving to others, um, gets drowned out. Um, and so, you know, quite apart from analysis of human nature, I, I think we're in a cultural phase in, in which we've become quite convinced that, that well-being is associated with consumption. Um, and that is a fruitless activity, but it keeps us from volunteering for other things. That's just my question. I have to say, you know, there was a concert that raised thousands of dollars yeah. for the same thing. But human needs are not just 
crises of huge proportion. There are also daily crises, like the person that you were talking about. Uh, and you know, we don't have a lineup of uh, sexy starlets and great talents or whatever you have coming and drumming that. That's the other thing. Right? It, it's something uh, that, and even there, uh, I, I think this uh, this term of, of, uh, of fatigue that's, that's associated right, with uh, development uh, of work that the UN does and various other uh, institutions do. So y you will see that people are now turning around and saying, well, don't give us that $1,000 check. Let us dip into your account on a monthly basis and take that out. So you won't even know. I think that's a problem. Okay? It's a solution, but it's a, it's a problematic solution. Perhaps the, the place that, that this concern can be addressed is with the children. That it's inculcated that if one of your friends has fallen down in the, in the yard, in the playground, you've got to help them up. And that makes that person stronger as well as yourself. You know, it's not a zero uh, uh, gain situation. It's a win-win situation that comes out of this. And I think that's, I, I agree, that's, that's a, uh, uh, from the me generation, uh, and maybe our generation, uh, mm -hmm. that's my generation, not you guys, <laughs> but my generation has that problem and perhaps it's a redirection that your generation can do. You know, bring up your kids so that they're looking out for the other. They're looking out for the other as, as ourselves. Can I add one other thing? I, I think it, is, it may not be peculiar to the Christian community, but, but this is still the dominantly Christian culture and this discourse tends to take place. Um, and and uh, Rabbi Hammond's statements reminded me of this. An idea has grown up that's quite peculiar, I think, to American Christianity, that doing something good for another person is really worthless unless you sincerely want to do it. In other words, you have to sort of get your yourself in the psychological mode of really loving the other person. And then once you achieve this particular psychological mode, then helping them is good. <coughs> but until you've achieved that, it's hypocritical. And we like to use that word. And I think one of the things that Rabbi Hanan reminds me of is that, and this actually has a much deeper tradition in Christianity, is, no, you do it because you were told to. You know, this great film and the great thing in, in Chariots of God, where they're talking about whether you should keep the Sabbath or not. And um, the, yeah, the old the old Scottish guy looks at this other guy and goes, "It's not a democracy." Um, by which he means you don't go to church because you feel like going to church. You go to church because God told you to go to church. Right? You may feel like it later. Uh, that, in my own Wesleyan tradition, is very deep as well. And Wesley, Wesley being Anglican, would have said exactly the same thing. Um, it's, it's a hopeless thing if you wait to be sincere, you know. And so we, those of us, at least in our tradition, this is where we need to rediscover a tradition of, of building disciplines and recognizing that discipline pathways then create this as a habit of life, you probably say meditation, and the, you know, that these become habitual ways of life that are, that are also habitual ways of being healthy. So, can I add to that? Yeah. Um, one of the things that happened in uh, public schools where I worked uh, for many years, but really through the 1990s uh, in our particular district, and, is that students had the opportunity to take a course called community service and get credit for that, but mainly uh, to learn the idea of, of uh, service. And I I think that that was something that was always there, but it was never organized like that. And it was amazing how many students wanted to do that. Not because it was a pass-fail class, but because they really uh, were interested in finding a way to give back, to contribute. And so, <coughs> what I learned from that is that uh, the idea of service has to be taught. Uh, there are, I, I do think there are folks who who have that feeling, maybe innately. But I think uh, the possibility for all of us to learn that is there. And starting with the children uh, is, is a great place. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
we have a question over here. Thank you. Oh, this is great stuff. And <clears throat> there's, Robert, and you know this all too well, there's also this sort of, I call it the doctrine of theological indifference in Christianity that has grown around this very sort of fundamentalist kind of right center, if you will, theology about raptures and what, what you know, it's like, well, who cares if the world is going to hell? Jesus has got to come back and clean up the mess, so why bother? So how, <laughs> how do you make the world more human with that kind of theology that's so prevalent, not in the Bible, Belt, but I mean, you know, <clears throat> throughout the United States, but... You're asking me? Well, no, <laughs> yeah, sure. But, I mean, it's a question of timing, though, right? Jesus has to come in your time. Otherwise, you're all so deaf. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now we're getting into real life, this and all that. But, I mean, but this, this, I love the notion of, of the commandment. And then the feeling comes later. And then you both sort of kind of discuss that idea. But what, I mean, what do you do with that example? sense... That, that sense of indifference, even in, even in your own faith traditions or your other faith traditions. May I give a practical example? Oh, sure. When I become a professor, and I have a bevy of students that I'm going to advise, that not the 50 master students that I do right now, one of the projects that I'm going to set them is to go and study the Ismaili community and look at how many kids have given up other careers to go and do voluntary work. Because the Aga Khan's teaching, just about everything that he talks about, he's talking about service to the other. He's talking about uh, uh, civil society. And this is a function of, in my humble opinion, it's a function of post-Cold War, where the two blocks have kind of collapsed, and we know how collapsing all of these countries are, where the governments are not able to provide for and have no inclination. There's a sense of indifference, a, a different theology of indifference there, not a Christian the, uh, uh, theology of indifference. But they're not able to provide for the well-being of their citizens. So the society which, the communities and societies which have held together by people cooperating, there is an encouragement of that. And I see uh, my younger brother is an example of this, where he gives up a career being the IT director for the third largest airline in the UK and going and working in Afghanistan. Just after, uh, while the war's going on. Right? So there's a, this is creating those structures, institutional, legal, uh, or just the, the concepts of look at the other face and as you said, you know, when somebody is welcome, <coughs> you're welcoming divinity. When you look at the other person, you look in the mirror. Right. And I can't solve them. I, I can't figure that out. That's too big for me. I'm going to depend on um, something bigger than me, my bishop in the whole church, or, or you know, um, or I'm going to wait till Jesus comes again and he'll sort it out. Um, and I'll, now I'll just hunker down because it's too big to solve. And um, there's some, uh, I think there's some wisdom in almost all the religious traditions that suggests that that's, that really your obligation is to the next person you meet. <coughs> you know. So, and I doesn't have to go to every funeral, but there is one in eight minutes <laughs> that you can walk to, right? And so, while the, while the massive problem of people who don't go to funerals is beyond his reach, he can actually do the one thing he's commanded to do. Um, uh, yeah, really, the next person you're going to meet is God, and so you don't have to wait until you meet God in some kind of eschatological super future, since in fact, as you walk along the street, this God's going to come right up to you, maybe with the handout. Um, uh, when I, I had a formative moment when I was about 20 years old, I was driving back uh, pretty hungover from a party in Lufkin uh, <laughs> with a friend of mine. Last week? <laughs> Uh, anyway, uh, with a friend of mine, and it was you know it was that late in the afternoon in some little back road from Austin, and we came across a girl who looked, girl, young woman, who looked really not, not good. I mean, she was she was obviously very pregnant. She was not particularly clean, um, and she was hitchhiking. And my friend goes, "Let's pick her up." And I said to him, uh, "My friend's much more mature than I was and less hungover." But um, 
I said, I can't pick up every hitchhiker, you know, uh, which I thought was a pretty good <coughs> set of reasoning. And he said, I'm not asking you to pick up every hitchhiker, just her. And, um, and so we did, in fact, pick her up and drop her off at some trailer park outside of Austin. Um, and I, I, but I've always remembered that. I'm not asking you to pick up every hitchhiker, just her. Um, I think if we can get ourselves in that immediacy of the moment, that helps solve this problem. And perhaps you don't have to solve that problem completely either. Yeah. And just get her to the other point that she needs oh, to Oh, yeah, exactly. We don't have to reform her whole life. Just get her to the trailer park. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's better than the side of the road. Are there any questions? There's one over here. I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, I just wanted to add, talking about uh, how visible consumerism is and how it's so easy to defer all of these things. There's, there's, it seems to me there's a model in American history, too, of people making it hugely big in industry, the robber barons, or in... Uh, uh, Silicon Valley or whatever, and then they start doing charitable activities, and those are the things that are getting advertised, and that's what the culture sees. The Carnegie libraries, um, well, how many people, <coughs> how many people's backs were those that money made on? Um, but I mean, how charitable was Rockefeller before uh, they broke up Standard Oil? You know, um, I'm just wondering if the way those things are advertised or spoken of also makes people believe, well, I shouldn't give you 50 cents to make a phone call if, or lend you my cell phone. Uh, but, you know, when I make it rich, I'll give you shares in Southwestern Bell. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I mean, Bill Gates is on it, right? Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's, yeah. it's, I think it sort of ties into what you guys have been saying. I, I I really appreciate what, what you said about the, the pleasure syndrome. I see also a stress syndrome uh, today with people working two jobs and, and really trying to juggle their priorities and, and thinking, hey, I really need to spend time with my family and my children, and maybe I don't have time to volunteer. So I think, I think that is definitely a factor, the pleasure and the stress are both factors. Another thing I see, and I, I'm seeing this now in India, um, is that there is more materialism. Uh, the Indians are a fast developing country, and some of our Swamis are quite concerned about that. But for me, I feel it's a, it's a natural trajectory that if we don't have it, what are we giving up? Whereas when we have everything we can want and still feel that emptiness, that is when people really start turning to religion and saying, I have it all. And now I have to, I'm making a choice. I want to, mm -hmm. I want something more. Mm -hmm. That world weariness. Yeah. Is there a question over here? Yeah. Are there pitfalls in mm -hmm. service? Pitfalls to the person who is doing service. Sometimes when we teach the young to do charitable acts, they say, oh, I will give to the poor. I'm going to give my teddy bear to this poor little boy. And what it does sometimes is it puts that child in a relationship of superiority to the child who's giving it to, rather than as Google would say, you know, I vow relationship. <coughs> so, uh, we've talked, in, in, all of you have talked about the positives, but are there pitfalls, are there problems, are there things we can stumble on as we wish to do well and do service? I'd like to answer that. In our, in our tradition, uh, in, our, in our Ramakrishna mission, our swamis and our nuns who are, who are doing work, it's easy to get caught up in the work and forget who you're working for. And then it becomes an ego-driven thing, and it's, it's a very subtle, but very powerful and insidious kind of drive that when our, our elders see it, they will remove us from
from the situation and transfer us out. So that is something. If, if, if the social service becomes predominant without the prayer and the meditation, then we lose one of the rudders. Mm -hmm. I would also add, and not contradict at all, I could add another aspect, that if the person gives, if the person does, out of a sense of volunteerism, then the danger you mentioned is obvious. But if it's out of a sense of obligation, then I've only done what I was obligated to do. Mm -hmm. I didn't do anything beyond the call of duty. Tradition says that the left hand should not know what the right hand is. Okay. So, continuing on from this. Okay. But those two hands do need to be in balance. And sometimes you're absolutely right, they can be harm to the recipient as well as to the donor. Uh, and yet, there is also learning. So, let me give you a story. Okay. This, is, this is something that's that stayed with me. Uh, I was doing some research in, uh, in Tajikistan, and I was talking to this head of, uh, of a development agency. He said, when, when the Soviet Union collapsed, I was an up-and-coming Soviet apparatchik. And then this AKBM thing comes along, and these guys are saying, come and work for us. I mean, nothing doing. I, you know, religion, uh, opiate of the masses, all of that kind of stuff. And he said, lo and behold, somebody talked me into it, and I was the I was assigned the job of monitoring that the aid was getting to where it was supposed to. So at that time people were boiling grass, that type of situation. But they had basically washed all their seed for the next year. So it was a very dire situation, 94, 95. And he said he went to this one village, and there was this woman who had gotten something like 50 kilos of flour two weeks earlier. And his job was to ensure that she actually got it. So he goes to the house, and the woman is just hedging. She's an old lady. She's hedging. She just doesn't want to tell where the flour is and show him and so on. Finally, he comes out and says, Show me the, the flower. She has no choice. She pulls it out. 11 kilos left. How much bread did you bake in the last two weeks? And she says, listen, you're here today. You may not be back tomorrow. The people down the street, they have helped me throughout my life. And we have helped each other. Today you see that I'm indigent, but they are doing okay. But it was incumbent on me to share what I have with them. This guy said, how do you measure that? How do you understand what that cultural value is? We who are brought up in this notion of measurement will say, aha, there's a failure here. Right? So great damage can be done through the system. But you have to understand the recipient and the de delivery mechanism and the intent has to be important. Thank you. Um, we might have time for one more question. But, huh? All right. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Can I ask a question? Sure. <laughs> what are you guys going to do for service tomorrow? <laughs> thank you. Well... Go to Hallmark. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have a question. What did that lady say to you about what it felt like to receive a letter written to herself? Uh, therapy is strange. <laughs> <laughs> and and when, when you're confronting yourself and, and when you are despondent, you know, you're willing to try different things. And so she was willing to do that. I think uh, it's incredible. So, uh, but, but, you know, she, she was, and, and as a therapist, she always <coughs> said, uh, let me give you something I would like you to do. You can explain, you say, can you do this? Will you do this? And a lot of times they will say yes, but when they come back the next week, they'll say, 
couldn't do it. But in her case, she did. Uh, on both of those instances. And again, that's what led to the dialogue <coughs> where she was going to go. I, I have one last thing. Oh, sure. I'm just quickly, I'm sorry. Um, you talked about earlier. You said you mentioned something about having a detached spirit in service. Yes. And then the rabbi mentioned connectedness and bonding within the framework framework of service. So being that we're in the service industry, <laughs> so we're in poor volunteers, I was just having a little bit of trouble reconciling which one I agree with. So I just wanted you to shed a little bit of light on that. Well, I, I can't speak for the rabbi, but in our tradition, uh, we have just talked about, you know, when, when we find that the ego has stepped in. And when we find that we're doing something out of guilt, out of pity, for name and fame, then it, then it, it, it's not a detached spirit. So detached spirit means mindful. Mindful. Watching the mind at the same time so that the ego doesn't Okay, thank you. And, you know, this is an important discussion, and so is its application. So, in, uh, in light with uh, Adlerian philosophy, we, we do want to honor some nonprofit organizations tonight that are doing good service um, and taking action on, on everything we discussed this evening. So, uh, but first, I do want to introduce um, to you ServiceRx. Uh, you know, I haven't been inspired by this project that we put together, this panel discussion. Um, a group of us have actually independently um, launched an organization called Service RX. And, you know, we've put together a great team. Uh, we're looking for people to build on our vision. And um, I would like to invite Ria Samani to just talk a couple minutes about that. So uh, I had a different audience in mind when I wrote what I wrote here. So I'm just going to look at it, but I, I, I just want to talk to you. A lot of you do a lot of good work, but you know, as Dina pointed out earlier, only about 25% of Americans volunteer. 75% don't. That's over 200 million. You know, if you can touch 1% of that, that's a huge impact. And I think what we want to do is, uh, through therapists, through schools, through uh, the judicial, uh, judicial system, through churches, through discussions like this, we want to pull people out of their shell. But what we want to do is create a clearinghouse that sort of understands these people, puts together a profile on them, whether it's psychological or vocational, understand what they're good at, understand what they want to do with their lives, and then connect them with the right <coughs> opportunity. So it's working with organizations that are going to be recognized in a few minutes here um, that we want to kind of help you guys get volunteers using those different channels. So uh, that's that's what Service Rx is about. If you guys want to talk more, uh, even the organizations that are here, please let me know and we'll get together on it. And we've got these uh, sign-up sheets, you know, if, if you're interested in joining us, please do. And, um, you know, if you just want to connect on it, we can talk about it more. Thank you. Yeah, please do fill out those uh, forms if you're interested, and um, we have a little box there if you want to drop those off. Anyway. All right, so um, we would like to honor our first local organization.